Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. My name is Chelsea Alexander, and I'm a Partnerships Coordinator at Concordia. And it is my pleasure to introduce the two panelists in today's Concordia Live to con continue a conversation we started last year on creating equal opportunities for success in America. As part of Concordia's commitment to carry on and amplify the movement towards justice, change, and equity, uh, we hope to continue to have these discussions that carry through year round, day in and day out. Uh, we are joined today by Mr. Gary Officer, the president and CEO of the Center for Workforce Inclusion, the largest and most experienced nonprofit <laughs> dedicated exclusively to workplace inclusion and economic opportunity for low income older job seekers. Mr. Officer is known for innovative value driven public private partnerships that remove barriers to community development. Under his leadership in his past role as the president and CEO at Rebuilding Together Inc., the nation's largest volunteer-based home ownership preservation nonprofit, the organization created award-winning uh, partnerships with blue chip corporate brands in support of the organization's mission. And on top of all of his brilliant work, Mr. Officer also serves as a Concordia senior advisor, and we are very grateful for his insights here on the Concordia team. I'm also happy to introduce Mr. Joseph Kenner, the president and CEO of Grayston, a nonprofit social justice enterprise, creating job opportunities and providing paths to self-sufficiency. For almost 40 years, Grayston has notably been practicing open hiring, where individuals, regardless of their background, are provided job opportunities at Grayston Bakery. Mr. Kenner's innovative leadership, experience, and ability to collaborate with diverse stakeholders ensures that Grayston de delivers the best services possible uh, to South Southwest Yonkers. Uh, given Mr. Kenner's extensive background in the government and community spaces, we're really excited to have him and Mr. Officer back in conversation for a continuation of last year's Concordia Live. Um, I also wanted to note that following last year's Live, uh, the partnership between the Center for Workforce Inclusion and Grayston was formed. So we look forward to hearing more about this collaboration throughout today's Live. And uh, before uh, Mr. Officer and Mr. Kenner jump into the discussion, I want to highlight a few housekeeping rules. Um, first, all attendees are automatically muted upon entry into the Zoom, but we hope that you'll take advantage of the chat feature to introduce yourself, react to comments in the discussion, or engage throughout the conversation. Secondly, to ask a question during the Q&A session, please utilize the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and finally, this webinar will be recorded and available on Concordia's webpage and YouTube channel. Um, however, the, the Q&A portion will not be recorded and is a special membership access benefit to those joining us live. Um, so I want to thank everyone again for joining us remotely uh, for this very important discussion series. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to uh, Mr. Officer and Mr. Kenner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chelsea. And I, I have to say this, um, Concordia's gift and the benefits that you provide uh, your members is not only the opportunity for public and private partnerships to be, to be formed around good causes, but your platform has also allowed nonprofits to meet, to share ideas and to collaborate. And since the last time we met, uh, Grayston and CWI have formed a partnership and I'm delighted uh, that the opportunity was presented for, to us to engage uh, Joseph and his team because they do tremendous work in Yonkers through the open hiring platform and a relationship I think um, that will yield tremendous results uh, for that community. So I wanna thank Concordia uh, thank the leadership team for bringing us together um, over the course of the last year. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Joseph Kenner. I've observed his work from afar. I have studied his, his business model. I have examined his leadership around engaging his community to find ways of bringing folks back into the workforce and his persistence in trying to remove barriers for those simply looking for an opportunity to engage in an honest day's work. So I'm delighted that Joseph has joined us today for this important conversation around Black History Month. Joseph. 
Thank you, Gary. It's so good to be with you. And I, don't, I have to agree with you. I cannot thank Concordia enough for bringing us together because it was through last year's discussion, which was incredible, that uh, we formed our partnership. And I want to thank you and the Center for Workforce Inclusion for placing your trust in us because we are doing some great work together for folks who are just looking for an opportunity and looking for a way to flourish in whatever field they want to be in, particularly that cohort of 50 plus years old that are formerly incarcerated. So we want to thank you and want to thank Concordia because uh, it's these types of partnerships, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, that need to happen as we build for a better tomorrow. So thank you. Yeah, that's appreciated. And, and in many ways, Joseph, you function at the most challenging spectrum of the African-American community. People who are poor, people who are ex-offenders, people who are looking for a second chance. But if we go back 58 years, a long time, right? I believe that the three most consequential legislations of the 20th century was the 1964 Voting Rights Act, the 1965 Civil Rights Act, and the 1968 Fair Housing Act. That was the the peak of the civil rights movement that sought to assertively frame and reposition and aspire towards a, an inclusive society where African-Americans had equal access to opportunity. Yeah. In that period since, our community had produced world-class scholars brilliant writers, artists, poets. And in, and in 2008, we elected our first black president in Barack Obama. Last year, we elected our first black female vice president in Kamala Harris. In 1964, the African-American community had five members of Congress. In 1964, there were five African-American members of Congress. In the 117th Congress today, there are 56 African-American members of Congress. We've seen African-Americans lead our nation's largest city, including New York. We've seen African-Americans lead Fortune 500 companies. And we also have African-Americans on the Forbes list of wealthiest Americans as billionaires. So obvious signs of success, right? What's going on here? Yeah, What's so- What's the problem? Yeah, excellent questions. And as we just learned today, uh, we will potentially have our first black female Supreme Court Justice in Ketanji Brown Jackson. Uh, so as you mentioned, Gary, by the simple fact that you've mentioned first, first African-American president, first vice president, that, that you have to say that's progress, right? I mean, it's, there's clearly signs of progress uh, for, for us as a people. The question really becomes, will there be a second? Will there be a third, fourth, and a fifth? And we, we kind of see this playing out in corporate life as well, and, and that's the question of the pipeline. Right, you know, who is going to be the next CEO in C suite, um, in the presidency, in, in the Senate, in Congress, and all of these other fields uh, that we are now breaking through? That's really the question is how do we build that pipeline? As, and as workforce development leaders, that's what we have to be thinking about and developing the solutions for. Absolutely, there's been progress, but we cannot let that be the end point and say, oh, We've done it, we've succeeded, mission accomplished. No, mission's not accomplished. We've made a lot of progress and we should celebrate this moment in history, but clearly we have to start thinking about the pipeline and building for the future in terms of who are the next fill in the blank. <laughs> yes, yes. And is it your sense that perhaps we can become a little complacent as a society 
when we have these visible leaders, visible symbols of success yes. as an affirmation that this country has realized its promise. Yes. And in fact, there are other underlying issues that that success may not fully expose. Yeah, and I think it's, it's written another good point as well. We, we cannot lull ourselves into thinking that there's, these are all silver bullets, right? Uh, we've elected our first African-American president. Racism is over. We, clearly it's not after, the, yes. after we've seen in these last two years. Um, does that hinder us? No, it does not. Does that stop us from succeeding? No, it does not. That just means we have to step up to the challenge even more. But we do get a little complacent, I believe, in thinking that because of these things are happening, we can rest now. Things are good. No, we're always going to have to fight. And you, you mentioned it earlier. We're talking about poverty. Yes. <laughs> we're talking about the Black community. There, are, there is no silver bullet for the things that are going on in each of those segments, right? Because it's a complex topic. It, it deals with education. It deals with the criminal justice system. It deals with business. It deals with culture. You know, it deals with just personalities and government. There are so many different facets to it. And because of that complexity, there's no one solution. There are many solutions and there are many different players, which argues even more for why we need to have the partnerships that we have. You know, more Graystons working with the Center for Workforce Inclusions, working with local governments, working with other businesses. We need those partnerships because, because of the complexity of the issue that we're dealing with. There are various solutions that need to be implemented and various strategies that need to be executed against. But do we, that's a great point, Joseph. And I, it had me thinking about the complexities and understanding that those complexities yield tremendous consequences, right? Yes. At the local level. But unless we acknowledge the issue, it's hard to address the solutions. Yes, yes. So if we take this 58-year journey, mm -hmm. the theme today, the 58-year journey, and despite signs of success, we have to acknowledge that there are persistent inequities in our society. We also have to acknowledge that uh, many Americans don't fully recognize that as a problem. In 2019, according to an opinion poll, it found that 97% of respondents, Americans, vastly underestimated the huge gap between the median wealth of African-American families, $17,000, and those of white families, $171,000, yes. a ratio of 10 to one. Yes. So unless we acknowledge the issue, it's hard to confront the solutions. Yes. We also have to acknowledge this. In 1964, the, 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 exp the, the life exp exp expectancy gap between blacks and whites was seven years. Last year, it narrowed to 3.6 years. So not only do we have significant disparities of income and wealth, life expectancy as a byproduct right, of lifestyle and struggle and stress, right, is also a unique experience to the African American community. How can we not just be more empathetic, but have a better understanding, right, of what's happened in our country? Yeah. Because that understanding informs humanity. Yes. That understanding informs compassion. That understanding drives solutions. Yes. How do we how do we get there, Joseph? Yeah, it's again a, a, another good question, a good point, and you've you touched on it a little bit. We we really just have to acknowledge the reality, and what you're really getting at, what I would point to, is we're talking about wealth creation, really. Yes. And and how how does that happen? Why is it that the the, the black family ten percent? <laughs> of, of a white family's wealth and and god help you if you do the the analysis and try and compute what the asian wealth status is i, I think it yes. would be even more stark 
the question becomes, what are the solutions to get to that? Because you were talking about wealth creation, we're talking, you talked about lifestyle and you talked about health. Those are kind of interrelated, right? So how do we really get to the solution for wealth creation? Uh, BCD, BCG did a great study, I think it was about two years ago, and they were talking about this wealth creation loop. And they were showing how, you know, white families are three times more likely to transfer wealth yes, yes. To, to the next generation. Blacks are twice as likely to be lack access to credit. And the other point was, you know, twice as likely to be turned down for financing. Yeah. Yeah. How do we get into this wealth creation loop where we can talk about developing intergenerational wealth, talking about personal finance, talking about entrepreneurship, talking about uh, retirement planning, estate planning, uh, the good news about all of this is, and I want to, we're talking about progress as well as the solutions. The good news is that, you know, we are now growing in different fields. So we're, we're getting more bachelor's degrees compared to whites. We're still lagging, but the rate of growth is greater for blacks right now. Uh, the access to credit now is uh, access to the stock market has improved. We're growing at a greater rate than whites. Again, still behind. And our, the, the fact that we're establishing more businesses than whites, again, still behind, but we're growing in those fields. We should celebrate that. But how do we continue that progress? How do we continue to train ourselves in financial literacy and getting the greater access to financing businesses? I sit on um, an advisory board for Red F um, that provides financing to social enterprises that actually target folks with employment barriers that always skews towards usually men and people of color, but investing in businesses that's employing those populations, that's helping them create uh, a pathway to success or a career like we do here at Grayston. How do we continue to make those types of investments so that we can really get this wealth creation loop going within our own community? That's what needs to be acknowledged. And there are solutions to all of those, but we have to acknowledge it first, as you said. And that, that's a really, Great response there. And I, as you were talking, I kept thinking about the challenges of the response. Yes. Right? And, and you have so eloquently described a kind of social entrepreneurial model yes. where capital and investment flows into the community to local innovators to help them expand their programming and offerings yes. within the community. That's, that's key. But it cannot be something that's viewed as a outlier, right? We need a massive infusion of capital, of investment that will move the dial far more aggressively. And there's one thing I've learned through COVID is that <laughs> there really is, this is not the time for incrementalism. Yes. Right? This is the time for big, bold action. And in many ways, I think we, because we've allowed our, inequ our inequities to linger, because we've allowed our inequities to deepen, the compound effect on the African-American community has yeah. been astounding. But something happened in March of 2020 <laughs> that forced us all to rethink our assumptions. This country survives and thrives at a frantic pace. It's almost a national badge of honor, right? And for the first time in, in many of our lives, lifetime, we had to simply stop. We couldn't, do, we couldn't do anything because of COVID. So I wanna share something with you that I think would make perhaps make us think differently about ourselves, our community and our culture. So I wrote this piece um, from a video I saw during the height of the COVID pandemic, right? It was a young man in London speaking from the top of his building where he lived, looking over scenes of an empty street, right? And he made this comment over a video captured images of different parts of the world. And what the images that he had seen told him about what's, what kind of world we lived in at the time. Let me share with you that quote, please. Please. So the young man said, and I quote, 
And it, it, the young man was describing Wuhan, Wuhan, China as thus. For the first time in decades, residents of the city were able to see the beauty of the skies because the smog had cleared. In Delhi, India, residents could hear the singing of the birds where they could not for decades. Families spent time together. Friends separated by miles now reconnected. Yes, there was fear, he said. Yes, there will be uncertainty too. But we will get through this, he said. We will emerge better for the experience. And better for the experience to, implies to me culture. It implies empathy. It implies concerns for those who are exposed to this virus because of their occupation, their race, and their vulnerabilities that were exposed by an inadequate healthcare system. So what role does culture have to play in getting folks and institutions yeah. to recognize our deficits around race, around equity, and around inclusion? You know, and thank you for that question, Gary. I... What is culture, right? Culture is, you know, a series of repeated habits and how we interact with one another, whether it's within an organization, whether it's within a family and a community, um, a, any given society. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, you know, me and others, whether it's in our conscious capitalism space or the B team, where we say you need a new leadership playbook in terms of how are we viewing I mean, in our space, it's inclusive employment and hiring, but really it's how are we going to lead this country of ours? Um, we're dealing with climate, and we're dealing with, you know, lack of trust in democracy, if you can believe this at this point in our history. And we're dealing with, I call it the great reassessment as you go through this great resignation and this yeah. unbelievable labor market that we find ourselves in where you know, we've got 10 million people that have left the labor force because of one or more barriers to employment. While at the same time, we've got 11 million open jobs and yeah. eight or 9 million folks officially unemployed, but looking for work. I, clearly the model that we've used in the past, and I say there, it's not an employee shortage, it's an employer outage in terms of how are we looking at our workforce? Where are we looking? to hire people? How are we hiring people? What in our organizations need to change? Because it is very clear, employees are going through a reassessment. <laughs> because to your point, because they were sitting at home for two years or whatever, and working from home or just not working at all, folks began asking questions. Do I even like what I'm doing? Does my company even care about me? Am I safe? Is this the right area for me? There's just so many different questions that people are asking now and like what am i here for and is this job and my sense of self is it a right match so as leaders we and this is not easy i don't want to make this seem like it's an easy question to answer but it, it's got to be answered <laughs> and there needs to be a collective response to it because no matter where you go we have partnerships with a, an organization called start foundation in the netherlands they're dealing with labor shortages. We've got our own partners here that are dealing with labor shortages. You know, even in our own administrative roles here at Grayston, it is hard to find people because everybody's looking for different things. And, you know, you're trying to find the right benefit package. You're trying to find the right salary. You're trying to, you're trying to be flexible with the, the, with the work from home policy. There's so many different issues that need to be addressed. But my God, if anything we can take from this, we need a new leadership playbook. And we cannot have this employer outage when we have so many employees, both current and future, saying, you know what, I'm kind of thinking differently about what I want to do, where I want to do it, and who I want to work for, and what that organization is all about. Because I think people are realizing now they have a greater sense of self now, and yes. they're not just working to, you know, just going through the grind. They're questioning everything. <laughs> and if we as leaders don't 
question as well and come up with a solution that answers those questions, we're going to be at a, a great loss. And that means economic development. That means so many different things that uh, we as a country can't afford to you know, sit on our laurels. But the questions we ask, Joseph, uh, it cannot be monolithic in terms of how we view the world, mm. right? We know about the great resignations. We know about the 10.7 million jobs and 4.2 million job seekers. We know that. We also know that in the best of times, right, African Americans were had an unemployment rate roughly three times that yes. of white Americans. We also know, and according to the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, that 75% of occupations currently filled by African Americans and Latinos have a very high probability of going away within 10 years. That report was written two years ago. Now it's not 10 years, it's five. Because the future is now, right? What can we do? to better tailor our workforce resources yes. to help the, with those who are most exposed to automation and technology. Because you go to a local bank in your community, there's a good chance those banks are closed. There's nobody in there. They're all banking by phone, right? You look at a, a bus, the last couple of weeks, those buses are two thirds full, not full, because older members of our community have decided I'm going to retire or I'm too scared to go out and work. Mm. Right? And younger people in our community lack adequate childcare to cover the expense of, of, of meeting the needs of their children while they are out working. So there's some very unique challenges in our community. Yes. How do we approach? those specific needs yes. so not exacerbating the disparities but would narrow the gap yes. how do we do that and, and that's why you know, i would say this too there's a, we are challenged by exactly the same thing yes so. and, and and to me it's a shameless plug for grayston you know this is why i enjoy working here because you know, our whole reason for being is to show how business can be a force for good. And that's how businesses have got to think about this. Yes, we could sell great products and services, but how can we do that in a way that addresses a social ill that fills in a blank for whatever communities we find ourselves in and all the communities are going to be different, but how do we solve for that? And you kind of touched on it already in, in terms of coming up with the solution. The meta trends are out there. You're absolutely right. There are jobs that are going to go away in a few years. And there are emerging industries. We see it here in the Hudson Valley, here in New York, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's you know, IT. Yes. How do we begin to create? And again, this goes back to what we were saying, that this, there's no silver bullet for this. This is a multifaceted response. How do we begin to adjust our education system to get folks prepared for that and access to that, but even within the business field, okay, how can I begin to recruit? Again, where do I look for my employees? How do I begin to recruit folks in, at the entry level to get them trained for these jobs of the future, whatever they might be in whatever area they might be? And then once they get into my organization, how do I keep them there <laughs> and create the pipeline for them to move up to flourish? and thrive. I mean, that's really, again, it sounds very simple, but it's, it's a very complicated response. It's not hard, it's just, you know, it's just a very complicated, it's not impossible, it's just very complicated to do all of these things at the same time and get the partnerships, because again, we're talking business, we're talking yes. education, we're talking people. So all of that has to come together, but the meta trends are there. So if we know that these are the jobs of the future and these jobs are going away and this group of people that's currently holding these jobs are going away, what's gonna to happen to those people when <laughs> those jobs go away? Are they gonna be on public assistance? That's not the answer. Are they gonna recidivate or, you know, or go into the criminal justice system? That's not a good answer because that's another cost to the system. How do we create the opportunities and the pathways for them to transition and transition into those jobs where particularly IT, education, healthcare, I mean, you can get an entry level job that people consider a middle skill job, but you can make a decent living and have a path 
pathway to even something better within whatever organization you're working for. So how do we create that opportunity for folks? It's funny because um, there's a famous Chicago author. His name is Studs Terkel. Studs was an oral historian who wrote a book called American Dreams Lost and Found. And this book was written in the 1980s where he was basically interviewing people that had lost their jobs because of the demise of manufacturing and the impact of the job loss on the person, their families, and the community from which they came. Horrifying stories of, of, of descent, people descended into, into awful habits because of the loss of work. When I think about culture, because we are also celebrating Black History Jersey. Yes. So I want to balance culture with the challenges of engaging our workforce so they can perform at their maximum capacity. Yes. Right? So in Chicago, the blues in Chicago came with people who moved up from the Mississippi Delta. And the Chicago blues is, is a unique variation informed by their experiences of work, right, in that city. Jazz in Louisiana is an, is an improvisational art form that came out of people's hard graft, hard labor in, in horrible conditions. And they found expression in the art of jazz. Yeah. Blues and jazz, I will say this, are two of the greatest art forms that this country has given the world. Classical music is European. Opera is European. It could be argued that rock and roll is British. <laughs> <laughs> but jazz and blues came out of the experiences of African-Americans. And much of that came through hardship and work and suffering. So work is important to our identity. Mm. Work helps to fuel our soul. It gives us strength and it binds our community. And the loss of work and or to be excluded from the workforce denies us an mm. important part of who we are. And in many ways, it denies us our humanity. Yes. So, so work is important. Now, we're one year into the Biden administration. Right? Much of what we've heard from the president has been about building back better infrastructure bill to try and bridge the, the, the broadband desert that exists across rural communities. What can we do as a country, as a government, to steer significant, and, and also the private sector as well, by the way. Yes, to steer that, I was going to say that. <laughs> into targeted community, so we could allow people to live to their full potential. It's a long-winded soapbox comment there, but I, I welcome your thoughts on what I just said. No, and I appreciate how you put that into context using jazz and blues as uh, really coming from our experience and showing the resiliency yes. of, of Black people and just how, in spite of it all, we still continue to make progress. So, yes. I mean, that's something to be celebrated, just the resiliency of a culture um, and the value of work that we place on that. So let's, let's celebrate that. It's why here at Greystone, we fully believe in the dignity of work and the value of work for all people, really, anybody. They, I think we, as our founder, believe uh, it is such an injustice when you have people that want to work, that have a skill, they have a good work ethic. Um, even if they don't have a skill, they, they want to learn and they're denied because of one or more barriers to employment. It was why we, to this day, and we're actually 40 years, this is our 40th year in, in business, um, we give employment opportunities to folks, no questions asked, to be bakery apprentices at our bakery. Joseph, be if I could interrupt you yep. one second, because I mm -hmm. want you to really tell the story of Grayston. 
Yeah. You've, you've hit on it from different perspectives, but you have a unique business model. Yes. You are serving an extraordinarily challenged community. Yes. And your open hiring platform has given hope and opportunity to many people. Yes. You are unique. You are a national model. And I salute your work. Tell the audience about what you guys do. Yeah, and, and the idea is we don't want to be unique. And as, as I was saying about our founder, we were founded actually on an idea, <laughs> not so much a product, but an idea or a question that needed to be answered. And that is, how do we give people hope? How do we create a thriving community? And our founder, Bernie Glassman, believed it's one job. Just give somebody a job. So at our bakery, we have about 110 employees, 70 of those employees, 98, 99% are people of color. I think it's about 70% uh, black, um, almost 30% uh, Hispanic. 80% of them come from right here in Southwest Yonkers. But all of our bakery apprentices are brought through our model called open hiring. So it's no questions asked, no background checks. You just got to put your name on a list. And when it's time for us to call for people to be on our line, when you get the call, you got the job. And that's it. You show up for orientation. And that's your first day on the job. First day earning a salary. First day, hopefully, to have a thriving career either with us through our for-profit bakery, or we have a foundation that provides workforce development training that's partnering with the Center for Workforce Inclusion. We'll train you in an emerging industry, going back to our earlier comment, where you can earn nationally recognized credential into an entry-level position in healthcare, IT, security guard, culinary arts, and you begin your trajectory there. And it's all beginning with folks who are the underserved. It's the, and with barriers. And we, we really have to think about this, Gary, barriers broadly here. It's not just the formerly incarcerated. We don't just work at, I think it's less than 30% of our population that's actually had some type of a justice involvement, but it's the single parent that can't work an AM shift so they can work our PM shift. It's the person who has English has a second language. Um, like I said, 30% of our population are, are, are Latino. It's the person age, as you know, Center for Workforce Exclusion, Inclusion, that's a barrier to employment. It's all of these different types of barriers that uh, folks have, and we're giving those folks an opportunity. When so many other businesses have said, no, you're not <laughs> male enough, if I can even say that, you don't have the right experience, you don't have the right education for entry level jobs. <laughs> yeah. And they're being denied, yet they want to work. And we see it, it's in the data, like numbers, you know, math doesn't have an opinion. So you, you see it in the turnover rate. You used to, and we've had partners because we don't want to be unique, like the body shop, who's seen their turnover rate decline almost by two thirds because you're getting loyal people. Again, resilient people that just want an opportunity. And if you give them that opportunity, they will stick with you. And you see your productivity go up 13% with some of our partners. You know, time to hire go from 30 days to seven. <laughs> all that's, and let's be business folks here, all of those are dollars. That's time that's now being reallocated to not keeping people out, but keeping folks in and seeing them thrive. It's those types of solutions and the new leadership playbook that we have to start thinking about. How can my organization do what you just said, Joe, so that I'm not unique? Because my goal is not to be unique when it comes to the hiring model. I want other folks to do some type of inclusive hiring, whether it's pure open hiring the way we do it or focusing on a population like you're doing, Gary, with the 50 plus crowd formerly incarcerated. How do we get to bring these folks in? Because when you think about it, you just think about um, Suzanne Clark, who's the president CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. She said this a couple of weeks ago. She gave a state of the economy. She was saying how in order for this economy of ours to grow, in order for us to have economic development, we can't just keep moving the current employees from sector to sector. Mm -hmm. We got to grow the employee base. Mm -hmm. And if you got all these people on the sideline, all these people on the fringes with capability, are, all, are they all going to work? Probably not, but if there are 10 million of them, can we get 10% <laughs> to be brought off the sidelines, off the fringes and into our workplaces and all these different entry level jobs and we get them trained so they can thrive? That, that's dollars, that's actually lost that lost opportunity that we're having because we can't get our products out the door because we don't have enough employees or we can't get deliver a service because we don't have enough employees. 
all of that gets recaptured. That's economic development. That's job creation. That's growth. And to your point, it's hope. It's hope for the people that you hire. It's hope, but hope is diminished when mm -hmm. resources are lacking. Yes. So our biggest program is funded through the Department of Labor. We serve less than half of 1% of the total eligible pool of needy individuals who qualify for our workforce training program, right? As a country, this is my, my, my soapbox for the last 12 months, <laughs> we, we invest compared to our global competitors, we invest at a minuscule level compared to the Europeans and uh, the Far Eastern economy, Asian economies on workforce investment. So they have a nimble workforce because folks are being constantly trained and retrained as the opportunities in the workforce shifts, right? So the challenge I think we face is, is to get more resources into communities to access more people who need those training and then to create a, a pipeline for those folks into the jobs that are being created. Yes. I did a study, a brief examination of the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, occupational categories in yes. Denver, Colorado. 22 occupations were listed. The top 12 occupations all had uh, extensive technological proficiency as a requirement. Most of our occupations had minimal African American and Latino representation. Management, healthcare, you know, um, technology based professions, banking at a high level. The bottom 10 occupational categories were overwhelmingly filled by African Americans and Latinos. Mm. Construction, uh, retail occupations, manufacturing, processing. And those jobs are the ones that are most likely to be, to be extinct in the next few years. But we have to tailor our resources to people and occupations that they are in, knowing that those jobs will likely disappear. That's a starting point. Mm -hmm. Then you have those who are challenged and we have to make sure that they have the resources made available to them for job training. They're calling for work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I am. So please, what's your thoughts on that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I have a saying here is you can't change the strategy until you change the culture. And we've been spending a whole time talking about culture. I learned that from former CEO of PepsiCo, Andrew Nui. But you can't divert the resources, Gary, until you get the focus on what the main thing is and how do we keep the main thing the main thing. And you just mentioned a a few sectors there that need to be players in this and need to have a focus on this government, business, and education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then all of the folks like us in the community-based organizations, social enterprises, we have to be at the table as well talking about this because we're on the front lines. We're, we're seeing it. You know, I have, I have both a business and a nonprofit, so I see both here. Unless we see these meta trends, again, you just laid it out, if we know that this is happening, that these jobs are going away and folks need to be retrained and redirected in terms of their skill set, what are we doing about it? <laughs> That's the leadership playbook that needs to be changed. Like we need to think about how do we create a more inclusive economy if we know that this is going to be coming around in the next, like you said, the future is now. So how do we make these changes now? And, you know, as particularly as a business leader, you know, we're, we're the problem solvers here. Yes. So how do we, there are things we can do right now that could change that. But it takes, it takes, it takes leadership. Yes. It takes servant leaders like you mm. that are working on in the trenches, enjoy close proximity 
to the people you are serving, to give you an appreciation for their stories, an appreciation for their needs, and to take that and to convert that into opportunities for employment. Yeah. It takes servant leaders like you, Joseph, and we need more people like you in the trenches doing what you're doing. And it also, Gary, it takes courage and intentionality to be very specific about this. Yes, yes. We, we have to be, you have to have the courage to speak out and speak up about these things yes. and be very intentional about, look, this is an investment and this is going to require effort. It's going to require our time. It's going to require our own political capital, perhaps. But if we have, if we're going to acknowledge the issue, acknowledge the problem and be committed to the solution, that's just not something we can put on our social media page or give a few dollars to a nonprofit and then walk away and say all is done. No, this is this isn't a relationship. This is an investment. This is a partnership. This is a strategy for, for the long term and the long haul that we all have to be invested in government, business, education, so on and so forth. All these different sectors have to be a part of that. Uh, and that's leaders at all levels in all sectors. Uh, let's go to that point before I, I move on. Because this country is founded on the basis of the free market. Uh, we pay homage to our great companies, like our, our iconic brands, right, for their innovation, for their success in driving growth, employing hundreds of thousands of people. So we put great stock in the performance of our companies as, as iconic figures in our community. And in this country, CEOs are as celebrated as athletes, <laughs> right? Over the last couple of about a year or so, particularly since the George Floyd verdict, diversity and inclusion <laughs> has become, has attained renewed focus and attention across our boardrooms in this country. Not a day goes by where we don't hear about a new chief diversity officer being announced at our biggest companies. You know that, you've seen mm -hmm. it, right? Do you think by hiring a diversity and inclusion executive that, that that's enough? That, that, that we need more than just um, ambassadors for for, for racial issues within a company, what we need is action. So tell me about the role of, of corporations in, in doing what you do, mm -hmm. which is to give people a chance, assuming they're qualified, assuming they're willing, and a point you made, which I want to recognize, and assuming that our applicants also have industry-recognized credentials to perform on the job. What role do you see for private enterprise and big company, corporate America, in playing a role in ensuring that everybody has an equal opportunity in the workforce? Yeah, yeah. I'll leave it to others to comment and other CEOs and or other folks in the C-suite to comment on the, the DEI chiefs. Uh, I can just tell you what we do here at Grayston and the DEI chief is the president CEO, Joe Kenner. It's my executive team. It's all of our hiring managers. And we very much believe in our mission and vision to unlock human potential through inclusive employment. And quite frankly, those are the kind of people we want here. Those are the kind of people we will hire here. You have to, before I even learn about your technical expertise and ability, I want to know that you are behind this mission 100, 200%, because those are the types of folks we want to have here. And we interview very deliberately almost to a fault about that so as a leader it's really starting with that why and and how why do we want to make these pitches and whether it's diversity equity inclusion how is that going to benefit the company and then solve all of these problems that we're talking about which is really the social enterprise model like how can what we do solve and you pick the problem, whether it's disconnected youth, whether it's the formerly incarcerated, how can your organization be relevant 
to that issue because we can't boil the ocean. We can't all solve all of these problems. Someone could take food insecurity. Someone could take disconnected use. Someone could take the formerly incarcerated. Um, Grace, and we take everybody who has a barrier to employment. But and that's where we be playing that space. <laughs> we don't go into climate and other issues. We be playing our space. But every organization has a role. I believe that they can play. You got to acknowledge that first of all, <laughs> and then two. How do you become effective in solving the problem? And again, intentionality and courage, invest in that. Okay. So it's really, it's you, it's you, the leader that has to make that call. Okay. And you have it, you have the power to do it. We are five minutes over. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this conversation <laughs> today. And I'm sure we'll have another opportunity at another time to do one more of these. So thank you so much for your time. Thank for you. your contribution and for your leadership. I Thank you, my friend.